Hi guys. Well, if you have made it this far, you have made it to chapter 25, Inside the Mind of a Planet Eater, which is the longest and I think the most important chapter of the book. We're going to have to divide this <coughs> long chapter up into three parts. <coughs> Kicking off part number one of Inside the Mind of a Planet Eater, we're going to start as I do quite often with this quote from this book that I was reading while I was down there, the Handbook for the New Paradigm. <clears throat> quote, It is difficult to consider that those who focus evil into recognition are of service to the planetary whole. It can be considered that they draw to themselves the evil that is present in the mass consciousness as a boil draws the infection present within a body to a crisis point so that it may burst or be incised and removed so healing may take place. So we are going to head back to Salvacion, Peru, and this story is spread out from July 13th to July 22nd, 2009, and we're going to start on July 13th with a handbone disclaimer. <laughs> to preserve the narrative flow of this rambling saga, I have elected to temporarily step out of diary mode and to squeeze this 10-day plunge into synchronicity into one compressed block of high strangeness right out of the pages of the Celestine Prophecy. As part of this exercise in journalistic license, I have taken the liberty of cutting and pasting disparate and disjointed conversations held over several days into more cohesive blocks. Therefore, what may be presented here is a single conversation <clears throat> as single conversations may in fact be glued together pieces of different discussions. In addition, I want to state clearly for the record that I did not have a tape recorder, damn it, or even a notepad to record the hours upon hours of long talks I had with the protagonist of this chapter. Therefore, any direct quotes I have attributed to him come from my memory, recorded at least twice per day, and so may not be 100% accurate, though I have diligently attempted to quote him correctly. Despite what this chapter may sound like, my choices of quotes and scenes are not some below-the-belt attempt to take a Michael Moorish cheap shot at anyone, but are an honest attempt on my part to interpret the flavor and explain the worldview of someone whose worldview is the total antithesis of mine. Finally, after much soul-searching and hand-wringing, I have chosen to change the real name of my main character to Moose Mulligan because he really is a nice guy and I really don't want to see him shit can by the bastards above him at Hunt Oil Company. Really, I swear. So, we're going to dive into it. When Joaquin Rivers and Spirit whispered to me that it was time to pack up my bag of cannonballs and move my freeloading invisible ass out of my long-term home at Manu Learning Center, I truly had no clue what adventure awaited me next. <clears throat> Beyond some hazy, half-baked notion of traipsing, traipsing off into the jungle in search of some lost Inca ruins, some three weeks off into a distant, uncertain future. As I stepped off the bus in downtown Salvacion, Peru on that drizzly Monday morning, I was living in the moment and being here now in every sense of those two bliss nitty terms. Wise, wisely, I turned my life over to spirit 
to lead me to my next destination. As mentioned in the previous chapter, Spirit <clears throat> and directed me to Salvacion's finest hotel, the Shayla, where I elected to move into room number 10, the upstairs corner room in the budget wing of the guest house. Less than five minutes after arriving at the Shayla, I, find, I found myself milling around aimlessly in the hotel courtyard waiting for eight young bio-garden volunteers to gather. I just so happened to find myself standing in front of the open door to room number one, the downstairs corner room directly below mine. Being the voyeuristic type, as you know all too well by now, I did what any nosy, quasi-peeping Tom would do when presented with an open hotel door. I peeked inside, and when I did, I just about fell over backward in disbelief at the unbelievable synchronicity and ironclad proof of the negative law of attraction that I was looking at. There, barely ten feet in front of me, spread across the back wall of the room like the pelt of some murdered spotted jungle cat, was a six-foot by four-foot wall map dated July 10th showing the 300 miles of proposed seismic testing lines where more than 12,000 explosives would soon be detonated, crisscrossing the million-acre pristine Peruvian Amazon wilderness of the Maracari Com Communal Reserve. That's right, my very room in a hotel I had never planned to see again in my life was perched directly atop the command post, ground zero, of my evil nemesis, the planet-eating Hunt Oil Company. I could hear Spirit and the Universe pissing in their pants laughing, high-fiving each other over this colossal cosmic practical joke they had just pulled on me. Or was the joke on Hunt Oil? I'm not so sure. <clears throat> to use trite words like stunned or flabbergasted to describe my reaction to finding myself staring down the throat of the tiger itself would be an insult to the dazzled emotions I was experiencing. In my deepest, darkest, doom and gloomy hambone imagination, I had enjoyed some brief, fleeting fantasies of one day stumbling upon the object of my deepest negative desires, but I had always spit the fanciful images back into the universe as being even less attainable than tracking down some hidden vine-covered ancient Inca ruins in a million-acre jungle for a myriad of reasons. First off, particularly since the massacre at Bagua and its attendant political fallout, I was suffering some bizarre, naive, utopian notion that a Texas-based oil company would voluntarily back off for a few months on the advice of their PR flats in Dallas, if nothing else, before moving into a Peruvian Indian reservation with their choppers and dynamite. Yeah, right, Hambone. In 2020 hindsight, I can see how brilliantly ludicrous that notion was. <clears throat> Secondly, I had played around on Hunt's own hilarious website and discovered, not so strangely enough, that there was no way for journalists to contact anyone at Hunt except some guaranteed to get the royal runaround phone number for some stuffed shirt in Dallas who no doubt knew or cared about as about as much about Madre de Dios Peru as he did the dark side of the moon. Before he, before he went south on me, Joaquin Rivers had confirmed that I had exactly zero chance of getting anyone at Hunt Oil Company to say one word to me. 
The third reason for my disenchantment was that nobody knew exactly when, where, or even if Hunt was ever going to set up shop in Salvacion, Peru. There was some vague rumor floating around that they planned to build a base camp and heliport out on the road leading down to Machuasi, the little bird-watching lake that I love so much, but even Hunt's shrillest critics had never mentioned to me how imminently this construction project loomed. I had some weird, paranoid Area 51-type visions of locked gates, armed guards, razor wire, and rottweilers populating my doomsday prophet fantasies of what Hunt Oil's command post would look like if I ever did find it. And the final clincher for the abandonment of my journalistic fantasies of ever getting inside the mind of Hunt Oil was that on the hair thin chance that I ever did stumble upon a real life petrolero, Spanish for oil worker, I would not be able to understand a goddamn word he said for the simple reason that Hunt, in a classic and predictable move to distance themselves from any potential screw ups in this dicey operation, had, quote, contracted out the seismic testing job, the first phase of the operation, to an essentially Peruvian-based operation calling themselves South American Explorations. Even if someone from that outfit was dumb enough to talk to a nosy, busy-body journalist from the U.S., it would be in Spanish, and anything he said in any language would damn sure never be authorized by publicity-shy Hunt Oil. Even as I stood there in dumbfounded disbelief, staring at a Hunt Oil-produced wall map, complete with a Hunt Oil-capped Peruvian dude standing there in front of it, I still figured that my old nemesis, the Spanish language barrier that has me so maddeningly crippled down here, was going to be my downfall once again. Unless, of course, that silver-haired gringo-looking dude tapping away so diligently at his computer, that guy surrounded by all that Hunt Oil literature all over his desk, might speak a little bit of English. Come on, universe, work with me here. With all the not need confidence of Jonah walking deliberately into the very gaping maw of the whale that would swallow him alive, I plunged across the threshold that separated a hotel courtyard in Salvation, Peru from Planet Eating Central and introduced myself to the most delightfully vexing character and genuinely nice guy that I had met since leaving the friendly folks in Texas six months earlier. Moose Mulligan, Louisiana oil man, Colorado beef man, globe-trotting geophysicist seismic man, yarn-spinning raconteur par excellence, an all-around regular Joe planet eater from the scorched earth depths of a dirt-worshipping tree hugger's worst nightmares. I introduced myself and shook hands with the trim, handsome, middle-aged environment, health, and safety liaison between Hunt Oil in Dallas and South American Explorations in Lima like I was saying hello to an insurance agent or a plumber. It would be days before I even realized that Moose walks like a planet-eating Hunt Oil Petrolero, talks like a planet-eating Hunt Oil Petrolero, Mulligan too surprise, surprise, was not a direct employee of Hunt Oil, but instead was the one-man independent operation known as Mulligan Natural Resources, specialist in geophysical operations worldwide and western slope, whatever the hell that meant. 
when he stood up to shake my hand, I was somehow surprised to see that this Marlboro man, about two-thirds Jimmy Stewart, one-third George Clooney, was right about my height, 5'8 or so. So, I began breezily as we sized each other up like two roosters before a cockfight. At last, I meet the infamous Diablo that everyone around here is here so freaked out. Uh, the, oh, I'm sorry. So, I began breezily as we sized each other up like two roosters before a cockfight. At last, I meet the infamous Diablo that has everyone around here so freaked out. Once I had translated Diablo, devil, for moose, whose Spanish is even more abysmal than mine, he waved off the comment with a self-effacing laugh that seemed genuinely nonplussed and surprised that his little seismic operation, and from his perspective, the proposed Maracari butchering really is a small potatoes operation, had any critics at all. He wanted to know just who his naysayers were. Oh, you know, a few local eco-lodge owners up and down the river, the usual gringo tree-hugging types you would expect, I said dismissiv dismissively, trying to get him off the defensive. Shut the fuck up and let him do all the talking from here on out, spirit screamed at me from my left shoulder. Fortunately, my ploy worked. Moose relaxed and stated clearly for the record that his job was only, only the exploration phase of the operation, essentially tromping around the jungle to look for geophysical evidence to see if there was enough of interest there to warrant bringing in the real big guns later. It's really pretty innocuous work, he assured me. Hunt pays me good money to be wrong 85% of the time. I swallowed the impulse to say it was not that 85% I was concerned about. It was the other 15% that had dragged my ass all the way from Texas. This would be the first of about 10,000 times over the next 10 days I would choke back some erudite hambone witticism. Moose turned the tables on me and asked me what my story was. I replied honestly that I was traveling around the Peruvian Amazon for at least a year and writing a book about my adventures. I handed him my business card stating clearly that I was a journalist. Oh really, said Moose, who I would soon learn believes that journalist with the exception of Fox News reporters, are on his sleazy ethics meter just below slime bag real estate agents, but way above that true scum of the earth, tree huggers. And what's the name of your book? He asked. Peruvian Plunge, I answered half honestly, conveniently leaving off the post colon the unfolding story of what happened when a middle-aged realtor from Texas moved to the Peruvian Amazon to kick Big Oil's ass out of the jungle. Sizing me up like he was Superman scanning me with x-ray vision, or maybe he was just doing a little energetic seismic testing on my psyche, Moose drilled a three-inch hole in my skull with his eyes and dropped in his first stick of dynamite. So, Samuel, tell me, what is your opinion of Hunt Oil? He stood there in front of me waiting for my answer like he was a doctor with my nuts in his hand waiting for me to cough. I had traveled for six months, if not 36 years, for this once-in-a-lifetime golden opportunity to have a real-live Amazon-smashing planet eater ask me point-blank to my face what I, Hambone Littletail, environmental alarmist, doomsday prophet, and chronicler of the downfall of Western civilization, 
thought about an evil, greedy bunch of thugs who could walk into a one million acre pristine rainforest wilderness, make that fly in with choppers to blow off 12,000 sticks of dynamite in their hell-bent search for the very blood of Gaia, my mother, goddess, and protector. If I had even begun to answer that question honestly, the flood of pent-up, ham-boned, psychic puke spewing out of me would have overflowed the Mother of God River and wiped salvation in the whole Amarakari Reserve off Hunt Oil's wall map. Much more importantly, it would have also squandered the equally once-in-a-lifetime golden opportunity to put into practice everything that Carlos Castaneda and Don Juan Matus had ever taught me about the art of stalking and allow me to climb inside the brain of a planet eater. There was no way I could let such a moment pass me by. With a straight face, and level voice, I looked back into the eyes of Moose Mulligan and let go with the lie that will haunt me for the rest of my life. I don't have any opinion about Hunt Oil, said the oil company's most virulent critic on the planet. I glanced over its spirit, boredly filing her fingernails on my left shoulder. She shrugged and gave me one of those don't look at me, innocent looks. Miraculously, Moose seemed okay with that ambiguous answer. He would love to continue this little chat later, he said, but he was a working man. I suggested we pick up the conversation that evening on the third floor terrace of the hotel with the sunset view. He agreed that was a grand idea. I headed off to go check out my first Peruvian bio garden and to wonder just what in the hell I had gotten myself into this time. Alright guys, from this point forward to the end of this long chapter, I will bid adieu to my diary format. <clears throat> Of all the valuable insights that Moose Mulligan provided me with concerning the workings of the planet-eating mindset, over the course of that next week, none struck Peter more than my newfound realization that planet-eaters are people too, as hard as that is to believe sometime, and that they really can be, in Moose's case anyway, genuinely nice guys. I I thoroughly enjoyed the time I got to spend with the man, and why shouldn't I have? He was charismatic, witty, often hilarious, articulate, intelligent, well-educated, University of Texas at Austin, where else, cocky, self-effacingly arrogant, not an easy target to hit, and most importantly, he had a heavy hand with the good, expensive liquor bottle at the end of every work day. I did, in fact, enjoy the guy's company more than any of the dozen or so greeny tree huggers I have met here in Peru. As hard as this is for me to admit, I could continue to be friends with the Peruvian Amazon-eating geophysicist if it wasn't for the minor detail that the Colorado beef mine beef man would grind me up into hamburger like one of his over-the-hill breeder cows if he were ever to discover the dirt-worshipping tree hugger lurking inside my little good old boy hambone heart. As a 38-year veteran of the oil business and a 14-year veteran of the beef ranching business, I have zero doubt that the man is dedicated to both his professions and genuinely believes in his heart that what he, do, that what he chooses to do with his life is as good for humanity and this planet as I believe it is bad. 
The end result of his life's work may be pure evil, but the means to those ends are nothing more than the dedication of a man doing what he feels is best for himself, his family, and his fellow human beings. As much as I wish I could hate the guy, he's a damn hard guy not to like. If it truly is as it appears to be a foregone conclusion that Hunt Oil, barring intervention from benign space aliens, is going to go through with its dastardly deed in the heart of the Mother of God in Salvation Peru, I would just as soon have Moose Mulligan in the dynamite controls as anyone else. Despite what you're getting ready to read about his love affair with explosives, I can assure you that Amara Kare could do a hell of a lot worse. On some twisted, ironic level, the man really does inspire confidence, even in a jaded tree hugger like me. Now, of course, if I could just sneak five grams of dried psilocybin mushrooms into his top shelf margarita and get him to pull his handsome silver haired head out of his ass long enough to see the light and the tragic error of his ways, we might just be able to get this planet-wide revolution in consciousness out of park. Lord knows we need more men like Moose Mulligan on the tree hugger side. Of course, Back here on planet reality, that'll happen about the time the Peruvian government turns Amaracari into a national park. When he's not hanging around with tree huggers like me or living the nightlife of Salvacion, Peru, what does Moose Mulligan do with his life as an environment, health, and safety liaison? between Hunt Oil Company in Dallas and leading a Peruvian seismic crew. In four words, he looks for oil. To do this in the jungle, he and his crew hack out meter wide. He promises arrow straight trails through the forest and a carefully laid out grid of crisscrossing lines. Imagine a one million acre fish net with 300 miles of string cast over the rainforest. This looks simple enough on a two-dimensional flat wall map hanging in Hunt's office, but if you've ever chased a herd of peccaries through the Madre de Dios rainforest with a rock-wielding Stone Age Indian, as I have, you would know that Hunt Oil is facing a Herculean task in Amaracari, which has the topography of a hedgehog and a creek or river flowing at the bottom of every steep jungle ravine. There's a reason that virtually nobody without wings or a prehensile tail lives in this topographically challenged, rain-soaked, impenetrable jungle even with a machete, it can take an Amazon native an hour to work his way up one little hill. Of course, petroleros, unlike Stone Age Indians, do have wings, or rather chopper blades, and as soon as Moose's crews finish carving out some 100 heliports into the virgin trackless wilderness, there will be plenty of convenient places to park their whirlybirds. A one-month slog through the jungle today will be a 10-minute chopper ride tomorrow. Once the trailblazers spreading out like leafcutter ants from fly camps spread throughout the reserve have penetrated this seemingly impenetrable no-man's land, along will come a group of guys lugging nine-horsepower portable drills. These guys will punch 50 foot deep, three inch wide hole, holes into the ground, one hole every 60 feet for the entire 300 mile length of the grid. Behind them, if I'm picturing this in my mind correctly, will come another line of guys laying out links of cable, each of which contains some 800 highly sensitive seismic sensors. Finally will come the guys with the dynamite who get to have all the fun. They will drop two to five pounds of explosives 
into each of the holes, fill the holes back up with dirt to preserve the integrity of the shock waves and detonate the explosives. If you were here standing 100 yards away, you wouldn't even be able to hear it, Moose assured me, though he declined to back up that statement with a demonstration of his innocuous technology. The seismic shock waves created by the 12,000 underground explosions are picked up by the sensors and the cable, which in turn transfer the echo images to portable computers. The final product, what all this fuss is about, is a whole bunch of squiggly lines, the data. If all goes smoothly in rough skin to Maracari, yeah, right, Moose estimates it should take about four months to cover an area the size of Yellowstone National Park with these little squiggly lines. If the rains cooperate, as you can tell, there are a whole lot of ifs in Moose's line of work. He would love to be back home in Colorado with his wife and kids and 600 cows for Thanksgiving. No chance. Once the data has been charted, Moose and his eagle-eyed geophysicist colleagues are on the lookout for signs of underground peaks or humps in the squiggly lines that could indicate where oil or gas, which rise because they're lighter than water, which in turn sinks into valleys on the graph, might be found. If any areas in Amarakari are found to be especially promising, i.e. full of peaks and humps, the petroleros will be back in a couple of years to punch a couple of test wells into those areas. And if any of those test wells produce commercially viable quantities of oil or gas, and obviously Hunt believes they will, or they wouldn't be spending this kind of cash, then the real party begins in about five years, and you can kiss goodbye to yet another million acres of rainforest wilderness on this planet. Boiling down the innocuous job of the seismic crews, Moose referred to his team as the head of the snake. Surprisingly, Hunt is not the first snake to slither into the backwoods of Americari. About a decade ago, Mobile Oil did a little poking around in the neighborhood, literally, but bailed after not finding enough of interest to warrant the monumental effort it would take financially, politically, and logistically to go in and get it. If that oil giant has given the thumbs down to Amarakari, why then is Hunt so hell-bent on going back in? Well, for a couple of reasons. First, as Moose was happy to show me on an old geologic survey map in his office directly below my bed, he believes Mobile literally missed the mark with their ancient 10-year-old seismic technology. Whipping out a map showing the position of that test well superimposed over a rough preliminary map of squiggly lines, even yours truly, with 30 seconds of experience as a planet-eating geophysicist, could plainly see that Mobile's drill bit had landed in a valley and missed the hump. More important than this tantalizing evidence, however, is the more general truth that if Mobile and Hunt are two snakes, then Mobile is a bloated, thick-bodied, slow-moving anaconda, while Hunt, as they brag about on their website, is a smaller, leaner, and more streamlined and fast-striking boa constrictor. While it takes something the size of a capybara or a peccary to get an anaconda excited enough to get off its lard ass and go hunting, something the size of a kawadi mundi or an agouti can get a boa constrictor's mouth to slobbering. In short, then, Moose Mulligan is the tongue of a boa constrictor, flicking in and out of 12,000 holes as he and his crews slither their way systematically along 300 miles of trails through the jungle. Who knows, 
maybe they won't turn up a single agouti in a million acres of rainforest, and they'll just keep on moving all the way to Iraq and leave it to some outfit from China to come back a third time. Maybe, maybe not. And in many ways, guys, that that right there is where this story could end in Amarakari for the next two to five years, barring some outright miracle that Moose Mulligan's worst nightmare could come true and that a bunch of those damn meddlesome tree huggers succeed in cutting off the head of the snake. Considering that there are no meddlesome tree huggers nipping at his heels, not counting a few eco-lodge owners along the river and one pesky old real estate agent from Austin, and considering the fact that the bulldozers and choppers are moving into salvation on the banks of the Mother of God as I write these words in a freezing hotel room in Cusco, fat chance of that miracle happening. All we can do for now is hope and pray for some miracle that the Hunt Oil boa constrictor doesn't find anything to get its juices flowing and slithers away on into the sunset. And as much as Moose would like it, I would almost be content to leave the story lying right here and go plunging off into my next Peruvian Amazon adventure, perhaps to Camasea or Bagua. But before I leave Moose with his dynamite and choppers and Salvacion, I want to linger with my favorite planet eater for a few more pages because regardless of what he does or does not dig up in Amarakari, I think you should hear a little bit of what this remarkable man has to say. Here then is the hambone filtered version of the world according to Moose Mulligan. And we will pick up the world according to Moose Mulligan in part two of chapter 25, Inside the Mind of a Planet Eater, coming right up. <laughs> 